Welcome to the Airgun Show. This week we've got the Gamo Coyote PCP on test, but before that I'm out on my woodland pest control rounds, targeting scavenging crows at the roost. I'm at roost shooting this evening on a sporting estate where crow numbers are starting to get out of hand. Now, most shooters will associate crows with being fairly solitary birds. You might see them in pairs or in slightly larger flocks when there's an obvious feeding opportunity, but by and large they're pretty solitary. That all tends to change at the roost. Certainly during the colder months, when at dusk, large flocks of crows will often flock their favourite places in the woodland to bed down for the evening. Likewise, Crows tend to be pretty cautious, wary birds, but that also changes at the roost when they become much bolder, far more confident, which means it should be easier to bring a few to book than it is trying to decoy them within range during daylight hours. So let's see how it goes. Well, the undergrowth is absolutely splattered with white droppings around here, and that's a sure sign of a busy crow roost. The abundance of it is also a sign of a big population. And that's one thing that's worth pointing out. Crows have an important part to play in the woodland ecosystem, so we're not looking to eradicate them, we're just looking to thin out their numbers. Successful roost shooting hinges on picking the right spot. That can depend on lines of sight, wind direction and more. I've already earmarked an area for this evening's shoot. Right, I'm going to choose this spot to start out. It gives me a pretty good arc of fire across some of these tall treetops where I'd expect the crows to flight in, use them as a lookout as they come in to roost. Now there's no hide building tonight, in fact I'm not even going to sit down. Standing up gives me a much better choice of angles to shoot at. And also, if I'm in completely the wrong place and need to move on, I can quickly up sticks and pick another spot. Right, I might not be bothering with a hide tonight, but I am going to put on my head net. It's quite deceptive, but when you're down in the gloom like this, Peering up into the sky, what little light there is can make your face stand out like a beacon. So the head net should make me just a little less conspicuous. Wearing a head net should be enough to hide my face from sharp eyed crows but the peak of my cap will also assist with concealment by casting shade over my eyes. We're fortunate to have a nice still evening tonight. Although that means I really have to think about keeping quiet, it also means I should have fairly still targets. Because crows roost in such high trees, if there's a bit of a breeze going, they tend to bounce around, which can make for a really awkward target to hit. Also, I'm using the FAC rated Mark IV tonight, and that extra power means I'm not limited to headshots. If the heart and lung shot's on, I'm going to take it. With the leaves off the trees and a nice still evening, conditions look favourable. So I'm determined to make the most of this window of opportunity. It pays to get into position before the crows start flighting. My session gets off to a slow start, with only a fidgety squirrel and a couple of passing pigeons to be seen in the treetops. But I'm not getting worried just yet, because crows often fly in at last light. You really do have to be patient if you're going to enjoy the cream of the crow roosting action. If you do a lot of pigeon shooting, and head for home as soon as the pigeons stop flighting in, it's very likely that you've completely missed out on the crows that won't have even started coming in to roost yet. Eventually, the air fills with the unmistakable sound of passing crows. Although these birds can be noisy, this is still relatively quiet, indicating that prime time for the roost still hasn't begun. A 
As the light fades, the crows start to bundle in, and I'm soon presented with the first shot of the evening. That's one in the bag. Shooting up at steep angles like this is a bit of a dark art and it does shift your point of impact. The best way to work out the effect of that is with practice. Get out and shoot up dead branches, conkers, cones, things like that when they're out. Work out where your points of impact are. Then in the heat of the action, times like this, you know exactly where to aim. And before long, it's time to put my shooting skills to the test once more. As more crows swoop in overhead, There are two in my line of sight, but as soon as I shoot one, I know the other will be off. So it's a case of picking the crow that offers the clearest shot and pulling the trigger. Well, there's another one. Normally I'd wind the mag of the scope right down just to get a bit more light transmission, but we're quite fortunate. It's quite a white sky tonight, so I'm seeing pretty good silhouettes. By now the crows are making a real racket. I know there are more to be had here if I keep still and quiet and choose my shots carefully. The hardest part is finding a route for the pellet through the fine twigs and the uppermost branches. Although crows are more confident at the roost, they're still instinctively wary, so it takes a while until I get another bird in my sights. Eventually, there it is. I can just about find the pellet a clear flight path to this crow, and it pays the price. That makes it three, and I'm hopeful of at least one more before the light is completely out, and it doesn't take long before the crows oblige. By now the filming light is really fading, but it's not so bad through my scope, and I reckon I've got a few minutes left to make a final dent in the crow population. really is going to have to be the last one. We're really struggling for light now and I know Nicky's missed one or two of the kill shots but we've accounted for about half a dozen crows and given that the action is so short and sweet because crows come to roost so late we've made the most of it. What I'm going to try and do now is pick some of these up because like squirrels tails fly fishermen will use crows wings to tie fly hooks so they won't go to waste. This roost shoot has been about managing crow numbers to reduce their impact on game birds, but songbirds will also benefit from reduced numbers of nest robbing corvids. With a reasonable number on the ground, I'm pleased with this evening's contribution, and I'm pretty sure the gamekeeper will be too. Well, this spring's nestlings should stand a much better chance now those crows are being thinned out. And now, it's over to the Airgun Show news. This is the Airgun Show news. Brought to you by the Airgun Centre. All eyes were on Daystate at the International SHOT Show in Las Vegas last week when the British manufacturer launched its eye-catching new Pulsar air rifle. The super compact bullpup style Pulsar takes Daystate's reputation for cutting-edge airgun design to the next level. 
Despite its high-tech credentials, the air gun is built for field use, and its electronic heart is sealed in a waterproof box for total protection from the elements. You can see it's a, a ballpark format, so the rifle is only 30 inches long, 170 centimeters. Uh, weighs eight and a quarter pounds, is, uh, three kilos, and has a 10-shot magazine, fully ambidextrous. The display screen built into the stock uh, it gives you low pressure, gives you shot count, and it gives you part of the three different power programmings in this rifle. Fully shrouded barrel, fourth the barrel underneath, and as I said, an electronic firing system which makes the cocking effort on the side lever very, very easy. I've been a bullpup fan for years. The, um, there was only so much you could do with a conventional long rifle. This brings everything back into a very small and exciting compact rifle. Day State's new Pulsar will be available in 177 and 22 calibre with walnut, ballistic nylon and laminate stock options with a price tag of just under £2,000. There's more on the Day State Pulsar in the March issue of Airgun Shooter magazine. Out now! And there's also a new airgun from Sports Marketing in the shape of a CO2 cylindered XS501 model, dubbed the Rabbit Destroyer. The airgun has an SRP of £150 and features adjustable fibre optic, open sights, auto safety, adjustable two-stage trigger and a tunable hammer spring. Its single-shot bolt action is powered by two 12-gram CO2 capsules or a 90-gram bulk fill. They will be one up for grabs in the free-to-enter competition in the April issue of Airgun Shooter magazine. To mark 20 years in the business, New Zealand's performance clothing specialist Ridgeline has released a celebratory anniversary hoodie costing £47.99. Warm and practical with a brightly coloured inner hood and contrasting zips that are further enhanced with embroidered special edition logos, we reckon its olive and orange design will look as good around town as it will in the field. Get all the details from distributor Highland Outdoors. And finally. Chronographs help air gunners map the performance of their hardware and ensure that they stay within the law. And the new Coldwell Ballistic Precision Chronograph, released via distributors Edgar Brothers, uses a high-speed processor and advanced data interface circuitry to deliver a factory calibrated output accurate to within a quarter of a percent. There's a light version for $47.85 and a £163 premium kit, which includes a tripod carry case, sunscreen diffusers and LED sensor lights. Results are displayed on the front-facing LCD, making it ideal for downrange velocity testing. That was the Airgun Show News. This week's test gun is the Gamo Coyote, one of the new breed of affordable PCPs. It costs just £399, but it's packed with the sort of features you'd expect to find on a much more expensive air gun, including a 10-shot magazine. Despite its relatively low cost, it also appears to be really well engineered. So let's take a closer look. The finish is exceptionally good throughout. The black alloy breech, which incorporates a fairly long, uninterrupted scope rail, looks really tidy and the bluing on the cylinder is also of a decent standard. At 95 centimetres long, it's a fairly compact air gun, and with an unscoped weight of around 3.5 kilos, it's going to be manageable for most shooters. The chunky beech stock is ambidextrous, and that does result in a slight compromise when it comes to fit. Working back from the ventilated recoil pad, the raised cheek piece is what I'd describe as hog's back style and it's high enough to give good eye-to-scope alignment, even if you're using fairly high mounts. The pistol grip is a bit of a handful, and I think it would benefit from slightly more of a cutaway for the thumb, just to help the hand mould around it. The skip checkering looks really good and very effective, and there are further patches to improve grip at the forend. It's a long and substantial forend, and that will accommodate a variety of holds. The Coyote has a hammer-forged barrel, there are close ties between Gamo and BSA, and if this barrel's half as good as those used on BSAs, it's going to be very accurate. At the end of the barrel is a ported muzzle brake. Screw it off and there's a half inch thread to accept a moderator, and you'll probably want to fit one because the Coyote has quite a bike. The gun is filled by a quick fill probe. Just slide off the sleeve at the front of the cylinder to expose the inlet, 
push it in and fill it up. A 232 bar fill will return around 140 shots in 22 caliber and about 120 in 177 at around 11 foot pounds. And you can keep an eye on air reserves via the gauge at the front of the cylinder. Not the best place to put it as far as I'm concerned because it means poking your head around the dangerous end of the gun. The magazine slides out easily after drawing back the bolt to cock the gun and there's a familiar air of BSA quality about those mags too. In 2.2 calibre they have a red drum and 177 is blue. You load them up, pellet nose first from the side with the slotted screw in. When it's fully loaded, push it back in, return the bolt and you're ready to go. The magazine rotates under spring tension and is numbered from 1 to 10 to count down your remaining shots. One thing that I really like is the fact it's located well beneath the scope rail, so there's no chance of it hindering the positioning of your scope. After each shot, simply draw back the bolt to recock the gun, then probe home another pellet with the forward stroke. Although the bolt handle's fairly small, it provides plenty of grip. Cocking this gun actually takes very little effort, and the forward stroke probes home pellets incredibly smoothly. There's a manual resettable safety catch just in front of the trigger. You push it back to make the gun safe and then push it forwards when you're ready to take the shot. It works perfectly well, but I'm not so sure about its location. Personally, I don't like the thought of poking my fingers around the trigger when I'm trying to make a gun safe. The Coyote is fitted with Gamo's SAT2 smooth action trigger. The blade's got a really nice profile with a wide flat front edge. It's a two-stage adjustable unit. Out of the box, the first stage had just the right amount of weight and travel for my liking. There was a slight amount of noticeable creep in the second stage, but not so much that I felt inclined to mess about with it, and I found it perfectly easy to predict after a few practice shots. So that's an overview of the Gamo Coyote's main attributes. Let's put up a target and see how it shoots. Well, I really can't fault that. I don't know how apparent it is, but it's a really blustery day today. And that's why we're shooting in around the buildings trying to get a bit of shelter rather than out on the main range. In spite of that, the Coyote's knocked out this five shot group just over 20 meters. It's got to be about 10 millimeters from center to center. Given the conditions, that's really impressive. This is certainly a gun that I'd be happy to take out hunting. The Gamo Coyote's given a really good account of itself today, and it's worth remembering that this is a multi-shot PCP that retails for less than £400, yet in spite of that relatively low price tag, there's no evidence of any corner cutting when it comes to design and engineering. And although this is a gun that hasn't really been designed to win target competitions, it's still surprisingly accurate, and I reckon that combination of accuracy and really solid build quality is going to win it a lot of fans from backyard plinkers through to seasoned hunters. That's all for this week, but we'll be back again in a fortnight. Thanks for watching and please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you aren't already a member of the BASC, it's time you join the organisation that works to promote and protect your sport.